Art Loft is brought to you by... Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. The Miami-Dade County Tourist Development Council, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade County Mayor, and the Board of County Commissioners, and the Friends of South Florida PBS. Art Loft. It's the pulse of what's happening in our own backyard, as well as a taste of the arts across the United States. In this episode, rendering the figure and the landscape, unique interpretations of classic art forms that produce not so classic outcomes. Hi, I'm Diana Thompson and I'm the Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs at the National Academy of Design in New York. The National Academy of Design is the leading honorary society for visual arts and architecture in the United States. We're here behind the scenes for the installation of our exhibition For America here at the Society of the Four Arts in Palm Beach, Florida. The show covers over 200 years. The earliest painting in the show dates to around 1809 and it goes through today. It's organized around a concept of pairs. One type would be the artist's portrait paired with their representative work. The question of why the National Academy of Design required portraits is actually a very difficult question because we don't know the answer to it. One of the theories we think is that this was a way of defining yourself to your peers. You know, you wanted to have an image of yourself that was for posterity, that people could look at, that people could think about. And then when new members came on, they saw this as a tradition, a living tradition spread out before them. My name is Jeremiah McCarthy, and I'm the curator of the exhibition For America. What's really fascinating about the portrait requirement is that the only stipulation was it needed to be a portrait. So it could be a self-portrait, it could be a portrait by someone who is already a National Academician, or it could be a portrait that someone painted or sculpted outside of the organization. And you can trace artists' relationships through the portraits, because as people start to ask their peers to paint their portraits, you start to get these interesting stories. I mean like William Glackens painted the portrait of Ernest Lawson and when he gave him the portrait, Lawson said, oh, I never really realized my face was that hard to paint. So as far as early 19th century portraits in the show, I would really love to tell a little story about our portrait of Samuel Morse. So it's the earliest work in the show, and I think when people think of Samuel Morse, they think of Morse the inventor. But he, in fact, had a very prolific career as an artist in his earlier years. In this portrait, when you look at it, it's a small portrait on ivory. The artist is not even 20 years old, and he is depicting himself already as an accomplished artist. It's incredible what can be done on a small, miniature ivory painting. Another great example is um, the relationship between Robert Bloom and William Merritt Chase. We have in this exhibition, you'll see, a painting by William Merritt Chase called The Young Orphan, which is unquestionably one of his masterpieces. It's on the cover of his monograph. It's lauded the world over. But people forget that when Chase was displaying his work, he faced really intense criticism of critics saying that his figures were too wooden. There was no life in a lot of the paintings. And so he painted Robert Blum's portrait. And Robert Blum had heterochromia, where you have one eye a different color from the other. And when you look there and you stand in front of this painting, you sort of see his soul beating in his eyes. And it's a challenge to sort of anyone to say if William Merritt Chase could couldn't paint, you know, life in a figure, here is this incredible portrait of his very dear friend. It's a really moving portrait. 
Charles White is one of the most important 20th century American artists whose work focused on the triumphs and the struggles of the African American community. And we were really fortunate to have the opportunity for this show to conserve a work by his that tells a very personal, um, poignant story. And it's a portrait of his great aunt, Hasty Baines. She was born into slavery in 1857 on the Yellow Lee Plantation in Mississippi. There's a letter that Charles White's wife wrote shortly after the artist's death where she explains that Hasty Baines for White served as this symbol of courage and wisdom. And these are universal themes that White explored throughout his entire career in his work. I think that when visitors come to this exhibition and they enter the first space, they're going to see portraits that are very homogenous. They're going to see people who look very similar. And as they move through the exhibition, they're going to see the Academy change just as America changes. They're going to see the rise of women artists. They're going to see the rise of artists of color. And then by the time they get to the final section of the exhibition, they're going to see some Something, which I hope looks more like the America we have today than the America of the past. You know, when you stand in the final gallery, which we're in, you have a self-portrait by a Native American artist. You have a self-portrait by an Icelandic woman who called New York her home. You have a self-portrait by a Chinese American artist. You have all of these different viewpoints, and they come together, and it shows you really that, like, the more viewpoints you bring, the richer the dialogue. Learn more about the Society of the Four Arts in Palm Beach on their website. Next up, Maryland Public Television profiles Amy Sherald, a portrait painter who shot to international fame when she won the commission to paint the former First Lady. I paint portraits because growing up, it was what I considered art. I mean, it was what I saw in encyclopedias of what represented art, so becoming an artist meant being able to render the figure. I knew that I wanted to be an artist around the time that I was in the second grade. I'm not sure I knew what that meant, but I knew that drawing was something that I liked to do, and I knew that I would rather do that than be around people. It found me. Yeah, I, I did not find that style. That style found me. I don't really have a descriptor for my style. I loosely attach myself to the genre of American realism. Being that I consider myself mostly self-taught, it's just how I paint. It's how I see, it's how I paint. My subjects are people of color because I choose to paint and put out in the world idealized versions of myself. Also realizing that if you look at the art historical canon, there's a lack of representation of people that look like me. And that was enough reason for me not to want to paint anybody else but myself. I don't place my figures within a context because I want the viewer to have a singular experience with the person that's in the portrait. The person that's in the portrait, they're aware of the viewer and they're aware that they're in this painting, if you, if you will. So since my work is a meditation on photography, a lot of the images that were taken of African Americans at one point in time were anthropological, so it's, it's also a critique on that frontal position. It's a soft confrontation and I also hang my paintings a little bit lower than they would normally be hung because I want them and the viewer to actually have a real interaction. For me, Michelle Obama's portrait, beyond the professional and the historical aspects of it, I think it changed who I was as a woman. I think it gave me permission to ask for more of myself and ask more of others.
Success has not changed me. It has given me more agency to do things that I want to do in the community. It's given me social leverage. I don't consider myself an activist, but I consider myself a humanist and somebody who is aware of what I have and what other people don't have and to share what I have gained with other people. I see myself evolving as a painter at this point mostly because I have a bigger budget and so it's going to be easier for me to make some of these larger paintings that I've been wanting to make for years but just didn't have the money to, to make them. And I'm not putting any pressure on myself to become a different person. I just am pursuing my practice in the same way that I would but with the ability to fund some of the bigger ideas that I have. I work in oil and I work in pastels. I paint with an underpainting and what I do is I paint with basically the opposite colors that I'm going to end up with. It kind of makes a nice uh, uh, vibration. I work with paper and then I use a brush and I smear the pastel with water so it kind of turns into like a watercolor. And then I draw end paint and I work back into that with gesso. So that, that's a freer, faster way of working than oil. Oil paint is a little more formal. You paint a day and then you wait a couple days and then you paint another day. Pastels, you only have to wait a couple hours. I paint landscapes for the simplicity and the color, the atmosphere. I'm attracted to the Florida landscape, the bright colors, the pastel colors. It's a funny thing. I, I go up north in the summertime and I think about doing landscapes, but I just, I've seen so many northern landscapes, I just am not attracted to painting that way. If I grew up up north, I would probably paint people. I rarely paint man-made objects. Occasionally there's a channel marker or there's a bridge. The old Seven Mile Bridge has some nice arches and I use that. But normally I get rid of anything man-made. I kayak a lot, so when I go out into the wilderness, I take a camera and I sketch with a camera, basically. So I'm attracted to places where there aren't any people. And if I paint, say, a beach, I get rid of the houses. <laughs> I made the keys my home because of the wonderful color and the serenity. It's just this, and my paintings are very simplistic. They're minimalistic, you would say. And it's just water and sky and a horizon. And uh, we got lots of that here. Uh, to have my work displayed in public places is a great honor. I have several projects uh, that I've done for art in public places, uh, a lot in the Keys, and several, two in Broward County and one in Dade County, actually. The most public and the biggest piece I've done and I'm probably proudest of would be the piece in the Murray Nelson Government Center. It's 10 feet high and 8 feet wide. It's a vertical and it's coming down a creek and coming out into the bay and you can see the bay and the bright sunshine of the bay and then you got all these dark dramatic colors of the tunnel. Well I've, I've photographed in that area several times. Once we were, my family and I were in a boat and I took a kayak. We had a kayak with us and I, I took a kayak into the bushes and photographed. And uh, that was a great day because my grandkids were with me and uh, I'll always remember that day. To see more, visit johndavidhover.com. I am Gonzalo Famayor. I'm a painter and drawer. I'm from Colombia, and I've been in the U.S. for 20 years now, 10 in Miami. I think it's a tricky question. I think I am a painter, that it's ironically using uh, the drawing medium as a way to paint. I see my drawings as dry pigment paintings. When the spectators come to my studio, I think they'll see drawings, small-scale and medium-scale drawings uh, involving text and uh, charcoal. In one hand, we'll see uh, maybe Macondo, text-based work. Macondo is a mythical Latin American uh, city based from 100 years of solitude, 
but also merge with McDonald's. So I'm dealing with the idea of the McDonaldization of Latino culture. And in others, they will see very Rococo-esque, Baroque uh, drawings, sort of uh, shifting between uh, exoticism and hybridity. I've been interested in the Rococo uh, imagery, uh, more so the Victorian era. I was interested in the way the Victorian era camouflaged its relationship with the colonies. So I wanted to show the discrepancy between these two worlds and how they merge together. In my work, I've been struggling with the dynamics of belonging. How does one belong to a place? I've been between two cultures, 20 years in the US, and I'm from Colombia. So when I go back to Colombia, I'm the gringo. Uh, my mom tells me, oh, you've, you've changed. Uh, you're now in a different person. And when I'm here, I'm always struggling to fit in. So should I enhance my accent a little bit more? Should I dress in a different manner? Should I draw, paint, act in a specific way to blend in. So my way of dealing with this is either I become very exotic or I become a hybrid. And between these two spaces, I've been negotiating my identity. I think my work is dealing with using my own um, sense of being as a way to ask these questions, which I think are universal at the moment. How do I want the viewers to see my work? First and foremost, have a physical encounter with the work. The work is big, so I want physically sort of a relationship between the viewer and this massive charcoal drawings. After that, I'm looking for a viewer who will negotiate his first-hand expectations of the work. What is this? Is this a painting? Is it a drawing? What's the space? And how the light is reacting within the space. I committed to the black and white uh, using paper as a medium. Uh, when I found out that I was being caged as uh, the token Latino artist, when I was in grad school, I was making very colorful paintings and I was using paint as a medium. But I, I found myself sort of battling the cultural expectations of color and my background. So uh, the Latino, the cliche Latino artist making colorful paintings. So I wanted to hide behind the black and white as a way to focus the attention to the image that I was making rather than how it was made. It enabled me to, to morph and camouflage myself within the work as well. How do I get going creatively? I'm allergic to the idea of the muse. I'm more about working, and working can be working at the studio, or working can be watching a movie, or reading a book, or you know, having interesting conversations. So I think that's the thrill for me in making art. It's not about this idea of the artist looking for a muse and being enlightened and then going to the studio, but constantly being at it and being open. It's joyful. For me, the most important thing about the work is making the work. When the work is out of the studio, I, um, I don't care about the work. I am, I'm very detached with the object itself. I'm more into the process. And now WVIZ Ideastream takes us to the Cleveland Museum of Art to explore photographer proofs of famous faces. For much of the 20th century, photographers worked with contact sheets to develop and select their images. Even when contact sheets were essential and an everyday part of photography, people who were outside of the world of photography normally didn't see them because they were part of the working process. Contact sheets provide a peek at how photographers work, like in this proof of photos by Larry Fink, captured at a New York gala. So we have the finished prints from this sheet, both of which are less than the full negative, but also both of which are the same square shape as the full negative. It's interesting that both of those are so tight on the emotion and action. Well, and he's, he's, he's feeling that he can make an expressive picture without basically having to have the expressions of the people's faces. It can be done through their physical gestures. Proof, photography in the era of the contact sheet, features many familiar faces, including images of Marilyn Monroe from early in her career. 
Philippe Palsman, who was one of the leading magazine photographers at the time, went out to Hollywood to photograph her. It was a large studio apartment, but it was still one room. And then th this is the picture that he chose. And you see at the top there, it's the hinge on the door. It's such a great picture. It looks like one of the great Hollywood studio portraits made in the, with controlled lighting. It's in her apartment. And then, of course, when it appears on the cover of Life, they airbrush the hinge away. The exhibit includes around 180 proofs and other works collected by the late Clevelander and museum trustee, Mark Schwartz. As far as I know, nobody has ever made a collection like this before. Schwartz's wife, Bettina Katz, says her husband's collection began with one contact sheet in 2002. And that image was of uh, Deanne and Alan Arbus. I don't think the artist was of particular significance, but it was a shoot for Vanity Fair. And I remember when he bought this. And as many things in my husband's life, you know when he gets an idea in his head, or a collecting idea, and then it just took off. Did you ever think that this collection would become an exhibit? I knew he was on to something. You know, he was a really smart man, and he started to pursue artists to create images for him, not just those that were used in the dark room. He had an idea about this. So, no, I'm actually not very surprised that it's an exhibition. What is surprising to me is the interest around this kind of nostalgia look back at film photography. One of Schwartz's special requests of an artist was for Richard Avedon to enlarge a contact sheet from his photo shoot with the actor Groucho Marx. After Avedon had agreed to make these for Mark, Mark proposed to him well, would you consider making a big one, like six feet tall? And eventually, Avedon agreed. Was that a common thing? No, completely uncommon. Although, you know, Avedon had been one of the people who pioneered very large prints, but of individual frames, not of a contact sheet. Even though he included contact sheets in his exhibitions, but not that size. I think it was part, partly the reason he said yes was because he was interested. He was interested in the contact sheet as a, as a trace of the photographer's process, working process. So he did agree, but there's only one of those. Yeah, and then it's right there at the, end of the yep. <laughs> end of the show. Well, because we're in Key Largo, it's a beautiful place to visit. We get tons of people from all around the world. And we have that, that map of the world up there for our customers to uh, post pins of where they're from. Hi, my name is Brandon Bennett. This is my shop, South of Heaven Tattoo. We're in Key Largo, Florida. And this is it. <laughs> A lot of tattoo parlors use what's called flash. It's mass produced pictures of artwork that everybody has on the walls that you select through in books and stuff like that. They say, okay, I like this one, I like that one, but can you change this, can you change that? And so they just sort of become guidelines. You don't really end up doing them anyway because everyone wants them changed into something that is more personal for them. I figure it's a, we're selling art, we might as well have our artwork on the wall. So that's why we have all of our own paintings and everything's original. So people can look around, see the style of work we do, and uh, know that if that's what they want to get on their body. Most of the art on the wall is done by me. Some of it's done by my son, um, Anthony. He's been tattooing now for a few years. A lot of times when, when I'm about to paint something, a lot of times you have like writer's block and you try to think, what am I gonna paint, what am I gonna paint? And so I, I usually think of a, a sort of theme before I paint on some things and I was just thinking Key Largo underwater but animated you know so nothing real they're not real creatures they're sort of cartoony animated things that I and I visioned a, a story of little guys living underwater here we're in the Keys so we do a lot of nautical things a lot of nature stuff we just like to have fun, do clean, awesome tattoos, and make people happy.
Head to Instagram to see more. Continue the conversation online. Artloft is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Artloft SFL. Find full episodes and segments on a brand new website, artloftsfl.org, and on YouTube at South Florida PBS. Art Loft is brought to you by Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. The Miami-Dade County Tourist Development Council, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade County Mayor, and the Board of County Commissioners, and the Friends of South Florida PBS. 